historically speaking, for the last 30 years, I've been the town crier here in Berwick. Tonight, <clears throat> my role as a town crier is very special. There aren't many of us around, but a town crier talks about things that the town should be cautious about or things that we should celebrate. Like I've, I've called and cried at 100-year-old birthdays, at weddings here in town, I've opened the town meetings. Um, but tonight, something very special is happening here in Berwick. And it's my proud honor to bring it to your attention as the town crier. Tonight we have a very interesting fellow that came into my life almost 40 years ago. A young man from the College of William and Mary had just, the ink wasn't dry on his dissertation. And he's just finishing his doctorate and he was here to really dig York County. Archaeologist Dr. Emerson Tad Baker is with us this evening. And I can't think of a more appropriate person to help kick off and rejuvenate and share the enthusiasm as well as history of our regional area. He is a man that can really get the ball rolling because he is a digger. He's done some amazing things here in the Berwicks. I think many of you probably know about the Chadbourne dig down in, uh, in South Berwick. He's distinguished himself as a scholar He's a dean at Salem State College, now Salem State University. He continues to be on the academic faculty there He's as a dean and a full professor of history. So it's my honor to introduce you to a, a topic that we all seem to enjoy here. It's about beer, <laughs> taverns, inns, and early New England. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Emerson Ted Baker. Thank you, Peter. It's an honor to be introduced by Peter, who actually, when he met me, it was when he, I was started to work for him, and my first job coming back to Maine from uh, being away getting that degree. So uh, many, many fond memories of Peter and Nancy over the over the years, um, and. Very honored to be here to help kind of maybe sort of re-kick off, re-energize the Berwick Historical Society. As, as Peter says, um, a lot of my historical and archaeological research over the the, uh, the decades have, have been in the Berwicks, mostly towards South Berwick, um, but also some folks in Berwick as well, too. Uh, Chad Wardig was in South Berwick, but a project actually I'm working on now on the Scottish prisoners of Dunbar and Worcester that actually involves some fellows who families who were some of the first settlers of, of Berwick as well in the uh, 1650s and 1660s and of course families that very much remained an important part of this part of the, of the state for ever since. Um, but uh, yeah, Peter's right. I mean, it's, yeah, my, I have a, a lot of interest uh, as an archaeologist and historian. Uh, some people say I get to have too much fun with the topics I study because I, I, I've written books on the Salem Witch Trials, but I'm also really interested in the history of, uh, of, of beer. So, and I like giving this kind of talk because it's one of the few times I actually can like have a beer while I'm giving a talk. I, I better not try that tomorrow when I'm in class, right? <clears throat> Especially my undergrads, you know, they're not 21, so I can't really talk about this stuff because I just, I don't want to see, you know, I really don't want to be a bad influence. Um, and they're always going, Professor Baker, can you talk about beer? No. Um, anyhow, so it's ex exciting to be here to be a part of this, and wow, what an amazing show. And, and corner point, I'd never been here before, and I will be back for sure. This is great. Uh, it is so great to see the rich craft brewing tradition as a part of kind of like really the growing local, making local, eating local sort of sort of movement here. And uh, what a wonderful, great community gathering place. And as we'll say, very much like taverns were here 300 years ago as well, right? So, so anyhow, what I, what I want to do today is sort of talk about the history of, of beer and ale a bit. To talk about, uh, actually, my efforts... Uh, well, in, in archaeology, we have this term called experimental archaeology, where we try to recreate past lifeways. 
And so, giving my, my love of archaeology and beer, I thought, well, what better than to try to recreate historic beers and ales? So, we'll talk some about that. And then also, too, um, a little bit about, about taverns here, because tavern life was uh, very, shall we say, exciting and not exactly what you'd read in the history books. So, anyhow, first off, please realize that beer or ale, and there is a difference both then and now, um, really old. Uh, and we know again from archaeology that the first evidence of, 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 uh, of, of beer manufacturing probably about 30,000 years ago. Um, and we know that it was in regular production uh, in a number of places oh, by around 7,000 years ago in both China and um, Mesopotamia, you know, the, the Fertile Crescent, uh, present-day Iran. And um, we know that the, the, the Sumerians taught the Greeks, who taught the Romans, who taught those wild tribes of Northern Europe, um, who we kind of get that brewing tradition from here, from places like Germany and, uh, and England. And to some degree, some scholars kind of wonder if it wasn't, not necessarily the rise of agriculture that led to civilization, but maybe particularly the rise of agriculture that led to brewing and civilization, right? So um, I guess, you know, sort of think of that as beer as a foundational block of civilization. If not, it certainly deserves to be, right? Um, so, um, now having said this too, ale versus beer. So, when you watch Robin Hood, and there's always Friar Tuck there with a large mug of, of, of beer or ale, he's drinking ale, okay? Because technically, in medieval Europe, in the early modern period, ale does not have hops. Beer had hops. And... Hops was one of these funny, well, we know how the British feel about foreigners like, you know, Brexit and things like this. And that's been a long-standing tradition between Europe and the continent. And so, you know, the British always, I think, looked very particularly uh, askance at anything coming up here from, 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 from Europe, from the, from the south. And uh, so when hops started to come up into places like the Netherlands and France, and people started brewing with it. You know, the British didn't care for this at all. Uh, initially, they saw, again, more sort of foreign stuff. And, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Um, 1542, Andrew Board wrote the book Dietary, which is really an early English kind of cookbook. And in it, he notes particularly, he says, ale, again, ale, not beer, right, is made of malt and water. This, folks, this is before they even knew what hops were, right? Um, and uh, basically says, if you put anything else in your, in your ale, you're ruining it. Um, and in fact, then, and he says, <clears throat> ale, for an Englishman, is a natural drink, right? Stout-hearted Englishmen drink ale, and it's those wussy foreigners like the Dutch and the French who drink this stuff with hops in it, this sissy stuff that they call beer. <laughs> now, <clears throat> having said that, of course, there's, there's been ongoing debates ever since about what you put in one's beer or ale. Uh, of course, in, in the 1500s, the Germans came up with their first Reinheitsgebot, the German purity laws, right? And there were about 300 states in Germany at the time, and most of them had their own version of the purity law, which essentially initially said, yep, beer is only made of three things, right? Water, malt from barley, and hops. Again, they didn't even know what yeast was. They knew there was the sludge at the bottom of the barrel, that if they didn't take some of that and put it into the next batch of beer, it wouldn't be any good, right? But they didn't understand it. But, and basically, they outlawed any other ingredients, right? And, and uh, well, having said that, I'll say, like, thank God not everyone listened to them. You know, like, like the, nothing like a good Belgian beer, like, you know, a nice sour or a cherry ale or, or, or a wheat beer like a Hogarden. Um, all of that would have been strictly outlawed by the Germans, right? Um, so like, that is to say, and to me, frankly, why I love studying this stuff, because... Beer is every as complex and historical as wine. Each what well, we know in America in the 19th before Prohibition, every town had its own brewery. You know, and isn't that wonderful to see it coming back, right? Um, and also, too, each region had its own style and its own way of making beer and ingredients. And and there even is terroir in hops and malt, right? Just as there is in, in, in wine. Um, so this is a sort of these ancient traditions. <clears throat> I will say, though, that after some initial resistance in England, they did begin to start to use hops and to make beer. 
Um, I will say, though, in the 17th century in particular, in New England, you see both, uh, for reasons we'll, we'll get into. So, you know, beer is coming into play. And, of course, also, too, how many, how many brewers or home brewers in the audience? Okay, at least a few. And you're saying, wait a second. That's not the difference between, that's not, the, the, that's not what ale and, and, and beer is. It's, ale, of course, is, it's based on the yeast, right? Ale, we use top fermenting yeast, and it can be brewed at a little more forgiving temperatures, more moderate temperatures, whereas beer, bottom fermenting yeast, a little more finicky, you need to lager it in cooler conditions, right? That's the modern definition, but in, in the colonial period, it would have been basically whether you have, have hops or not. So, um... Beer does become, and the use of hops does become more popular in New England and in England in the 17th century, but within limits, because, um, well, as we'll see, it was a, they were in short supply. And having said that, though, whatever it was, whether they were drinking beer or ale, it was very important to life back then. It was so important that the Mayflower literally, when it came over to New England on its first voyage to bring the group called the Pilgrims, they literally stopped when they ran out of beer. This is true. This is, this is true. In, in actually, a um, great quote from, from Mort's relation from, from 1622. When, and again, you know, they got here. They got to Cape Cod area, and they're kind of floundering around as to where to settle uh, in much of November. And finally, they say, uh, he says, um, we could not now take time for further search or consideration, our victuals being much spent, especially our beer. <laughs> right? People after my own heart. Um, so, uh, and of course they say, yeah, well, it's also December 19th, so it's time they settle down somewhere. But here's the thing, folks. That's how important beer was. Now, no, the Mayflower was not the first booze cruise. Though, I don't know, maybe Plymouth Plantation could use that as a fundraiser, huh? Um, but, but seriously, um, and no, that doesn't mean these people were, were loaded, but it emphasizes how important beer and ale were at the time. Um, and, and it actually makes sense when you when you think about it, um, because the Mayflower also had water on board, but you really didn't want to drink that unless you had to. Because think about this, you know, the water came from the busy docks of Plymouth, a pretty large city in, in England at the time, and the water's coming out of wells out of people's backyards where their chickens and goats and livestock are, and it's right next to the privy, and there's a cemetery just up slope, and then you're gonna then you're gonna put that stuff in a barrel and let it sit for two or three months and drink it? It literally might kill you, right? Now, we all know beer, well, won't kill you, at least not immediately. <laughs> but here's the deal, and people, again, people did not know anything about microbiology or anything like this, but by lucky coincidence, right, as we'll talk about, when you make beer, you boil the wort. And that's killing off bacteria. And then you're adding in preservatives, hops or other things, herbs. Right? And again, so you're preserving that beer, and you don't have to worry about getting sick from it. So literally, it was safer to be drinking beer than water. And most people in England and New England in the 17th century, their preferred drink, breakfast, noon, and night, was, yes, beer. Now, hang on, it wasn't as much fun as you think, because what they're really drinking is what we call small beer, right? And um, I won't get too technical here. There's probably some brewers here who can do a far better job of this than I can. But just to briefly, how you make beer. Well, you grow barley, you harvest it, you start to germinate it or let it partially germinate and turn into malt. You, har you, you gather that, you kiln it, and... Then you take it to make beer, you, you grind it up, you put add water, boil it up, and there's your wort, that's your basic liquid, your liquor, if you will, right? Your sweet sustenance to make beer, that wonderful, wonderful smell, right? Uh, kind of like liquid, literally liquid bread is what you've got here, folks, right? And there's, there's a reason why those medieval monks didn't mind lint, because it meant 40 days of doing nothing but drinking beer, right? Um, so, so seriously, you know, um, once you, once you, but once you got that wort, as it's called, um, what you what you do is, and you, then you can add when you boil it up, and then you can add some hops for preservatives, herbs, or if not hops, we're adding other other herbs for bittering agents and, and preservative. Um, but once you once you do that, you cool it down, you pitch your yeast 
put it in a nice dark place where it can where it can ferment over two or three weeks, and literally within three weeks, you got beer. I mean, it is really one of really one of God's miracles, isn't it? Um, you know, uh, pretty amazing stuff. Um, but having said that, and I don't think I don't know any brewery that does this, and I would like to see them experiment with this. You can. And again, it seemed a very frugal Yankee thing to do. You can get multiple runnings of beer. What you do is it's called loudering, right? When you basically run water through the through, through your through your mash, and uh, the water that comes off the liquor has that sugar in it. Because basically, what we're doing here to make beer is the yeast wants sugar or carbs that it can it can eat and turn into CO2 and alcohol, right? And so essentially, you can do this with pretty much anything, right? Um, and um, so that's, that's what they're really after here. But think about this. If you run that water through once, you have what they call strong ale. It's probably maybe seven, eight, six, seven, eight percent, depending on, on how much mulch you got in there. Well, let's do that a second time. Right? Why waste perfectly, perfect, perfectly good wort? And so you, you run water through it again, louder it again, and you're going to get what they call table beer, maybe around 4 or 5%. Then you do it a third time, and you get, you've heard this, you never realized before, that's small beer. People crying in their small beer. Yeah, 1, 2%, basically light beer. And that's what the stuff is that people are drinking, you know, for during the work day at least, breakfast and lunch, on the Mayflower and other places. And, you know, maybe with dinner they'll break out the table beer, and then afterwards they go for the, 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 the high-end high stuff. Um, so uh, and they didn't have imperials by, back then, but they had some pretty strong ales, depending on uh, on who was making it. Um, so that's why the Mayflower. It wasn't like you know they were drinking stuff that they were like loaded and falling off board, but it was necess necessary to. And even children, right, would drink you know the one percent stuff, um, and did just fine with this. So in this way, beer and ale were necessities, absolute necessities of life in early New England. And in fact, it would have been sort of a, a, a weekly or regular duty of every housewife or of members of the family to brew beer or to brew ale um, because the family would have needed it because that's their safe supply of, uh, of drinking water for the most part. And I actually, um, actually when, uh, when I was working for Peter at, at Old York, I uh, excavated the site of the governor's mansion at Point Christian on the York River. It was probably built about 1634, and I started reading up about the site uh, as we were digging it, and uh, wonderfully enough, the letters of the deputy governor, Thomas Gorgeous, survive, and they're published, and he arrives, he's a 22-year-old kid when he arrives as the deputy governor of the colony of Maine, the province of Maine, in 1640. He's the essentially the acting governor, uh, Sir Ferdinando Gorgeous, the proprietor, the owner of Maine, who's the, technically the governor. He never even got over here. So he sends over his cousin, Thomas, to run the place for him. And here's Thomas at the time when he gets here, 19, 1640. He's 22 years old, and he's fresh out of the Inns of Court in London, essentially what we now recognize as law school, right? So essentially, here's this young college kid um, with probably some good habits of drinking beer. Um, first letter he writes back home when he gets here is to his parents. And he basically, in it, he, he brags about, he wants, I think he wants to reassure them about his housekeeping, right? So what's the first thing he talks about? Don't worry, I'm brewing beer. And again, to me, I'm going like, is this being proud of your housekeeping, or is this like the college kid who's, who's uh, you know, starting off on his own in life and thinks the most important thing to do is brew beer? Um, so anyhow, um, in this first letter he writes, he says, I brew beer one day, and tis good stale beer by the next. And we drink it till we have made an end. And then we drink water till we can get more beer. Right? Ah, uh, some things never change with college guys, right? Um, the weather is hot that quickly sours it. So you have to, well, we drink it fast because it's a hot May summer and it goes sour really fast. So we got to drink it before it goes bad. I, I've probably used similar lines on my parents uh, too. I, some, I suspect some of you have as well at one point, right? Um, so, um, and so he says, but you know, uh, the weather, it sours in the hot main summer. And likewise, I want hops. I don't have hops, see? I can't, it's getting hard to make beer. I may be making ale, but now I'm making a cellar to store the, 
the beer in, right? And I've also sent to the Bay, to Massachusetts, for hops. So a couple of problems here, right? So think about this. Hops are native to the New World, but most of the varietals that they're actually uh, using to make beer are English varietals of hops. Um, if you want a nice heirloom sort of quality of hops, because these are not the hop bombs we think of today. Um, think of uh, East Kent Goldings is a traditional heirloom um, kind, of, uh, kind of hop um, that are um, probably about, about, the right, um, about the right type to use. And um, the, um, the, the problem is, it takes, any of, you, any of you grow hops at home? Oh, if you don't, they're great. They're wonderfully invasive. They'll take over your garden, and then you have to pick them and brew beer. And by the way, every year we, uh, we, we make a wet hop harvest ale, which is just spectacular, right? And if you, people say, like, does it really that make that much difference to, why would you, you know, I go, no, literally, we pick the hops and throw them into the boil. And I get strange looks from people. And they go like, "Why would you do that?" It's like, "Well, would you would you rather would you rather have your hops fresh or not? I mean, would you when you're when you're cooking dinner, do you go get frozen or freeze dried vegetables, or would you rather have something fresh out of your garden? Right? Same thing with beer. And if you get a wet hopped ale, and a lot of local um, breweries actually make them in the fall, definitely do that. Um, but the problem is, it takes at least three or four years." to get a good hop yard going. And as I say, I know because we, we, we raise hops mostly Cascade and Centennial, very small scale, um, but just enough to make, you know, a, a, a nice, like a five gallon batch. Um, and uh, so it takes a while to get those going. And in the meantime, you're trying to get stuff from England. At the same time too, by the way, the other thing everyone's planting, apple trees. Because really, I hate to say this in a brewery, but probably in colonial New England, cider was a more important drink than beer. Uh, and pretty much every farm had an orchard, and uh, it was important to make cider as well, too. And also, not just apple trees, but also pear trees. Um, if you haven't ever had perry, pear cider, it's like the high end, it's like the, kind of the champagne of cider. And in the 17th and 18th century, it's the stuff that they would pull out just for the special occasions, you know, like New Year's and various and weddings and various festivities. And in some places you can get it to, um, I don't know if any of the local places make it, but I know, for example, like Magners and some of the bigger uh, bigger cideries do uh, do make berry, and I highly recommend it. So anyhow, those first few years that people are here, you know, they have to ship, try to get hops from Massachusetts, or we're waiting for them to come from, from England. And if not, if you don't have hops, if you don't have malt, you, you make do. Um, and I will t tell you this, when we excavated that ho the house from the 1630s, we found the hearth, so we actually have the place where that, uh, that kettle, that beer was being brewed, and we found the cellar. It was a 15 by 20 foot cellar that he built under his house, so he clearly wanted to have a lot of beer, uh, protected from going sour, right, so he wouldn't have to drink it so fast. Um, and uh, and it is, it's, it is clear the way it was built, it was literally built inside the building, not the, uh, it was, it was not integral to the construction of the house, and it was actually at a slight angle. So, yep, just like in his letter, he, he, he gets to the governor's mansion, which is basically, he describes like my lord's barn, and then he starts digging a cellar under it for his beer. Um, so, um, anyhow, um, the, um, this was sort of standard practice, right? And, and even, and Gorgeous, as a bachelor, is over here doing this with his, with his, his uh, hired hands, and everyone else would have been doing it as well, too. Well, so here's where the experimental archaeology comes, folks, right? Um, I um, said, well, I wonder what some of this stuff would taste like. And the good news is, the earliest surviving written recipe for beer was published by a man named John Jocelyn, who lived in Scarborough, Maine in the 1660s, went back home to England and published a book, published a couple of books, actually. One's called New England's Rarities, and it's the first natural history book of New England. He talks about the different flora, the fauna, the Native Americans, you name it. It's it's fascinating. Uh, and then he also has almost like a throwaway line about the type of beer they made here. Because again, when you don't have the ingredients, you, you make do. So um, he says, we made our beer of molasses. Again, we don't have malt really, but molasses has sugar in it, which you can convert into carbs and into alcohol, right? So um, molasses, water, yes, check. Bran, we don't really have 
malt or barley, but we just kind of sort of like the scrapings, right? What's left, and we'll throw that in. Chips of sassafras root. Yeah, think root beer. Interesting flavor here. And a little wormwood. And, and so, yeah, you know, um, and, and apparently, if you're not distilling it, you know, it, it is into absinthe that doesn't have any mind bending properties, but it's really good as a bittering agent, right? So, as it happens, um, I have a buddy, a buddy uh, Butch Heilshorn, who some of you actually may know, who used to be the co owner of Earth Eagle Brewings. And um, Butch and I, when, when he was co owner before he sold out to his, his uh, brother in law, Alex, his half, um, Butch and I used to experiment making. Jocelyn's recipe and other fun 17th, 16th, 17th, and 18th century recipes. And if you know Butch, he is one of the most fearless brewers you can imagine. He will brew with literally anything. And, well, you'll see what I mean if, if you when I say anything. For some of the things that we actually uh, brewed with. Um, so... Um, Butch and I, over the years, um, and particularly Bru Butch is really known for Gruitz. He's got, wrote a really wonderful book, Against All Hops, which is about brewing botanical beers. That is Gruitz, or non hoppy beers. Gruit is the old German word for herb, right? And it's basically a beer without hops. Um, so he was kind of into these things and said, yeah, that sounds good. Let's, yeah, we can brew these things without hops. Let's, let's try Jocelyn's recipe. So, you know, Butch and I are kind of worried about this, because to some degrees, like, frankly, the more accurate you make this recipe the less good it's going to be, right? Because first off, in the 17th century, all beers are cooked over an open cauldron, so they're basically going to be Rausch beer, smoked beer, which is not everyone's cup of tea. And basically, cleanliness was not next to godliness in the 17th century at all. Uh, contamination, wild yeasts get in and do all kinds of things. So we were kind of worried about the reaction to the beer, but it actually, they, the first batch lasted, I think, about four days and was gone at Earth Eagle. Uh, this is back in the days when they just had like this, this six lines. And uh, so I said, okay, well, let's try some more of these things. So um, it actually was pretty good. And uh, uh, again, like I think it probably, we were worried that it, it would be too accurate. Uh, and in some degrees after this, a lot of times it would be like, okay, Butch, here's what the recipe would have looked like. And then let's talk about what you're going to do with it. Because you are the, 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 the mad scientist chef. That can they can really do cool things. Um, so we did a, a, a bunch of these, and I could again I could talk for like hours about the different recipes and things that we tried. But I know you're much more interested in drinking your beer and having some food, so I won't bore you with too many of the details. But I will give you a couple. Um, there's this great poem that inspired us, a bit of doggerel written in New England, probably in the 1630s. It's a folk song called the Forefathers' Song, and one of the stanzas that gives you an idea of basically what they're willing to brew with. If barley be wanton to make into malt, we must be contented and think it no fault, for we can make liquor to sweeten our lips of pumpkins and parsnips and walnut tree chips. Whoa. Yeah, well, gal uh, Butch is in my take on this. We, we made Gallows Harvest. Actually, this is about the time that I, I published my book on the Salem Witch Trials. So I said, well, and, and Butch and Alex are like, well, we have to have, you know, like a signing and celebration party here, and we have to brew a beer for it, right? So... It was Halloween, Salem Witch Trails, Gallows Harvest. That sounds good, right? You know. So, um, but also too, what is it? Was, Gallows Harvest was a gruet made with parsnips, heirloom squash, and Maris Otter malt, which is again is a very mild English malt, very traditional biscuity kind of nice, nice taste. Um, and um, we were thrilled too uh, that um, we were we were invited to, um, to Cambridge Brewing to uh, be an entry in their Great Pumpkin Festival that year. And that was so cool to be down there with all these different uh, different gruits and beers with pumpkin and squash. Um, we tried a lot of other things. We've actually, uh, maybe my favorite was cock ale. And this will give you an idea of what we were willing to brew with because technically, um, cock ale has um, nutmeg, raisins, oranges, mace, and yeah, a rooster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, no rooster actually died in the making of the beer. Um, it, it was time. A friend of ours, uh, Kit, had um, served a rooster and a couple of chickens whose time had come. And uh, so, um, yep, they were they were they were they were um, dispatched and. Um, 
plucked and flayed and uh, you add them, it's an additive. You put them like in a base bag, uh, when, you, when you proof your beer, add your yeast, and then you add in, you know, with the mace and all these other things. And also, too, it's also you're putting it in usually with a, like a quart of Madeira as well, too. Um, and, what, what, and no, it doesn't taste like rooster. Um, but, but what it does, there are actually some recipes where they suggest you put an egg in, a whole egg, right? Not broken. We're not entirely sure why, if this was like to proof it or what. But um, this one didn't call for that. This just called for the, for the rooster. Um, but again, you wouldn't taste it. And in fact, if you want to think of those ingredients, what it tasted like is a good, really uh, a good winter ale, right? A festival like a Christmas ale kind of thing, you know, um, something like that. And was and again, was really good. And and yes, cock was a double entendre in the 17th century as well. This was this was, this was the fav, this was the favorite drink of William of Orange, King William the Third. Um, and also, probably his wife, Queen Mary, might have liked it too. Uh, because it was, shall we say, uh, supposed to enhance one's uh, fortitude, manly fortitude. Uh, so apparently, back then, uh, women would grab their husbands and boyfriends, rush them to the, to the pub ha or tavern, and have them drink a pint or two, and then rush them home. Um, and in fact, there was a whole... Uh, in the 1680s, there were 1670s. There was a, a, a flyer that someone wrote complaining about Englishmen now drinking coffee that it was bad for them and basically bad for their fortitude. Uh, and they were, and, and this this uh, sort of spoofs demands that all Englishmen give up the coffee and just drink cock ale. Um, I'll 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 just leave it at that, and you can use your imaginations. Um, so. You know, we, 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 we've made a, lot, a number of different kinds of recipes like that, a few others as well. And I think we're still thinking one of these days of, uh, of doing a, um, a book on these, on these different recipes with a bit on the history of the beer and the ale and the life and times. And then also the other part of the chapter would be Butch's and my efforts to, like, recreate it and the fun we have doing that. Because, of course, as any brewer will tell you, that's half the fun, right, is actually, is actually brewing it. Um, so... Um, I, again, I could talk about this stuff forever, but I, I do want, before I, I finish, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about how important taverns were. I mean, like Corner Point, right? This is the meeting place. Taverns were the meeting place, the import, the, one of the most important buildings in a town in the 18th century, in the 17th century, in, uh, in New England. Um, the, um, it was a place where travelers would come and could get a meal and, and safe lodging. Um, by the way, you should know more than three or four people to a bed. And, and male travelers only, women rarely travel, especially unaccompanied. Um, but so it was kind of like a necessary evil to have them. It was the largest house in town oftentimes. So usually it was the place literally where the circuit, when the circuit court came through, it would meet usually in the tavern, right? I mean, realize colonial meeting houses didn't have heat. At least the taverns had hearths and fireplaces that kept people warm. And also the judges, when they went on lunch break, they could just have their pint and, and food right there in the in the tavern and then start up afterwards. Um, so they were very important. A lot of time town meetings and selectmen's meetings uh, were, would take place in, in taverns. As a matter of fact, I know in uh, the 1650s, actually, when the Portsmouth selectmen met, they literally burnt the, the earlier town records. They were meeting in, in George Walton's tavern, and they literally, the reason the, the first 20 years of Portsmouth history doesn't have any surviving records was they decided that they didn't want those records survived, and they literally burnt them in the tavern, uh, in the fireplace, uh, which is, 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 a, is a historian is deeply saddens me. But anyhow, um, so in this sense, though, think about this, because Massachusetts takes over New Hampshire in the 1640s, Maine in the 1650s, and kind of tries to enforce Puritan orthodoxy. Now, they don't have that much luck up here, and they know they can't push too hard on that. Um, but particularly, too, Puritans don't like taverns, right? I mean, again, necessary evil. We need to have them for society to function, and when people are coming into town, they need a place to stay. But also, as we know, well, taverns occasionally create temptation, you know? I mean, you know, it should be one and done, but sometimes lead to, oh, you know, women and dancing and singing and gambling and all kinds of things like that. And uh, so, and that, you know, that's that's a problem. It's like, well, 
my daughters are all safely into their, my two daughters are safely into their 30s now, but as my wife and I used to say to them when they were heading up, remember, nothing good happens at a tavern, especially after midnight. Right? So, um, anyhow, um, so Puritans sort of put up with taverns, but they licensed them on an annual basis. You would only have it for a year and it had to be renewed. And once it was, you know, and then it's really funny actually because, so then in the court records, you see all the stuff that happened in the tavern the past year, people complaining, and then what do they do? They'll renew the license anyhow, or the, 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 the father, they'll take the license away from him and give him to like his son or his nephew or something. Like, you expect something different to happen, right? Um, and in fact, actually, if you want to have some fun, read the old court records. The main province and court records are transcribed and published by the Maine Historical Society. I suspect you have a copy of them in the local library. And uh, they're great because they talk about all of these kinds of crimes and activities that take place in the, in the tavern. To give you an example, in one court session in Berwick in, let's see, what year was this? 1670. Now at this point, probably the court is, is meeting down in what's now Southburg, right? Because at that point, there aren't many people living what's now Berwick proper, right? Uh, you get, get about more than a mile above what's now the South Berwick line, and basically up here there would have been no one living here until the 18th century, except Native Americans, because it just wasn't, wasn't safe and a little too remote. So, but still, the court travels around Maine, and they meet in Berwick. And amongst the cases, they'll do it like four times a year, the quarterly courts, and this one time, they had about a half dozen different cases that all involved incidents in taverns over the past two or three months. Listen to this one. Um, Daniel Goodwin confessed before the court that he struck Humphrey Spencer, who I think actually was his cousin, on the head with a stool. Um, now, having said this, Goodwin was the tavern keeper, right? Um, and uh, his tavern actually was near Oldfields, right, down in South Berwick. And... Um, he admitted that he did this because he was drunk at the time. Um, and two other men confessed to the fact that, yes, they'd been at John Gattonsby's tavern, uh, and where they happened to have been there, they'd snuck in on the Lord's Day, on the Sabbath, in the morning during the sermon, and were drinking beer, and skipped, you know, it was required by law to attend worship on the Sabbath. And these guys decided they'd just go have a couple pints instead, which might have been more productive use of their, their time. Um, and another one, Nicholas Frost, one of the, of the Frost Hill family in Elliott, right? He confessed, he admitted that he was so drunk that he tried to stab himself with his own knife. <laughs> and he confessed, quote, that he was in such condition that he did not remember what he did. <laughs> Ripped from today's headlines or what, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing we see in the police blotter all the time, right? But some things, 400 years, you know, 350 years, things have not changed all that much, sadly, perhaps, right? Um, now, where was this, where did this court meet? In John Gattonsby's tavern. <laughs> right. And he, he never apparently lost his license either, you know, so anyhow. Um, and um, I just, I'll close briefly by mentioning you about, um, I wrote a whole book, actually, really centered around a tavern. It's called The Devil of Great Island, Witchcraft and Conflict in Early New England. And it's set um, on Great Island, present-day Newcastle, in 1682. And it's set in the, the debauched tavern of uh, Quakers George and Alice Walton. Um, this is such a such a place that fornication takes place and and uh, illegitimate children are, are born as a result and and they have an unfenced well that one of the one of the grandchildren actually drowns in. As one, as like one title of one chapter is the neighbors from hell, right? Um, but uh, turns out throughout the summer of 1682, um, at regular intervals, every night at 10 o'clock, their tavern is according to them, supernaturally assaulted by flying stones from a lithobolia, a stone-throwing demon. Um, who, and, and of course what happens is they accuse their widowed elderly Anglican next door neighbor of being a witch. She countersues and says George is a wizard, uh, and, and so on, right? So, but, so here's my, my point, folks, right? Um, this is not, I don't think any of you read any of this in your history classes. Right? Not in those books. The teacher probably didn't mention things like this. But this was the real New England, particularly here in Maine in the 17th century, right? It wasn't 
quite as straight-laced as Puritan New England was in the South, and frankly, Puritan New England wasn't quite as straight-laced as they'd like you to, uh, to think of either. Um, interesting story here, too, and it does get to Berwick, because, as it happens, within a month, there's a copycat incident where there's a stone-throwing demon attacking the house of Antonio and Mary Fortado, who do live on the southern end of, of Berwick along the Salmon Falls River, um, over around, like, a New Dam Road in that neighborhood. And um, so the, uh, and Mary, actually Mary walks out uh, one morning out of the house and she has a huge welt over her eye. And they say, Mary, what happened to you? And she says, um, oh yeah, it was the, the stone throwing demon that came up. From, well, as you tease it back, you can see what you're really dealing with here is a case of spousal abuse, right? Um, that you only read about because you're, you're learning about what you thought was witchcraft. Um, but anyhow, that's, that's, a, that's a whole different story. And uh, maybe sometime I can come back and talk about that. Um, but that's probably a, a good enough place to end. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hope to, uh, I'm happy to, to uh, answer some, some questions. But, uh, and, and also too, I know probably people are getting thirsty and hungry. So um, I'll just say, uh, I hope you like the somewhat different look at life in early New England. And again, like people free to get up, mill around, what have you, go, if you need to, must go home and watch the lions, you can do that, I suppose. Um, but I'm also happy here to stay. And if people have any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer questions. So thank you very much. Yes, come back here. Yes. Um, mead, of course, is a very ancient traditional drink that's been around for a thousand years or more. I mean, those old Viking mead halls were very real. And in, and in fact, too, there would have been, uh, they, 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 they produced honey here, and they certainly produced, produced mead as well. Yes. So, I mean, they had a full range of alcoholic beverages. And of course, they're also, they're also distilling molasses into rum. So, yeah, you name it. So they're all authentic colonial drinks. Yes, go ahead. So, yeah, that's the one that's literally just in the front yard of Old Fields that, that my friend Neil DePauli excavated for a number of years. Um, that is actually Humphrey Spencer's Tavern, which is a little bit later from the 1690s. Um, I think this I think this one was the other side of Old Fields, but it was in that neighborhood of around that intersection because that's also where the original meeting house was for Burr, which is I know you you know Don, yeah. So it's that was kind of like the crossroads, the original sort of crossroads in, in Burwick at the time. And I think both of the taverns, um, both Goodwin's uh, and Gattensby's Tavern were in that neighborhood. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. The cocktail, okay, yeah, it's hard to get out of your mind, isn't it? So it is. Um, I won't even talk to you about the, air, uh, the ale that Butch made using beer meat. Bear meat. Oh, I can't. I, that was my beer. Oh my God! Yeah. yeah. Butch is a good friend. Yeah. And I wish you were here. Um, but anyway, uh, so can you give us a little talk about the Irish Catholic Church and how they really have the yes. Culture, yeah. Uh, you know, especially sometimes Butch and I have, used to have a traveling road show where we'd sort of do a song and dance and do this kind of talk together. Actually, sort of a longer, almost like hour-long sort of format. And Butch, in particular, likes to talk about this because that's one reason Hobbes were looked at askance by people and controversial was because again there was this concern about the fact that well, Hobbes will help put you out. Right and and where whereas uh, Gruet and herbs will tend to wire you, uh, fortify you. Yes, exactly. So there was a question: To what degree was this a plot by groups like the Catholic Church to try to? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, absolutely. So there was a hops are there's a fascinating history to to hops and their and their effects on people. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning that. Yes, yeah, Sue. Yeah, I'm wondering what what here in line. I'm sorry, was beer and ale? Speak up. Was it for the masses and then the upper classes drank wine and maybe alcohol? So, everybody? certainly I know, you know, beer and ale was for everybody. Absolutely. Um, 
That's a real good question. You know, in the 17th century, I don't see a lot of social differentiation, I think. Um, but, but certainly, wine was very popular here. As a matter of fact, um, major element of the Atlantic trade, right? The codfish and lumber that's leaving Maine for the Caribbean um, is part of this trade involved in Portugal. And one of the things that's coming back is wine. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Peter Pope, uh, late Peter Pope wrote a really good book on this called Fish Into Wine. And it was basically how the English fishermen in, in Newfoundland, through this exchange, turned their codfish into wine. So particularly, so you begin think of things like um, Madeira and Port, and a lot of these two even like fortified wines. Um, but it wasn't just like, but it, I don't think it really was just like an, uh, an elite thing. It was like pretty much for anybody. It was just sort of, frankly, part of it was preference, but also part of it was honestly what was available, right? Because depending on how the ships are going and what hops you have and stuff, what local stuff's available, what's imported, right? Um, and then also, too, they're, they're, they're early on, they're distilling rum. We know there's a they're, um, we know there's a sugar house that they're making sugar in Portsmouth with molasses by the 1750s. And that also means they're probably distilling molasses into rum. Yeah. It's, uh, the, in, in, we, the sugar house was in the south end, and I can't find out exactly where it was, but I'll say, you know, every time I, I, I go over the South Mill Pond, and I, when I go out to, I, I work a lot with the Newcastle Historical Society, um, as I start going out that way, I saw so somewhere up on the high ground to the right was, was where um, there's an advertisement in the Portsmouth paper in the 1750s for the Sugar House, and the name of the owner, and I haven't done the research to figure out exactly where he lived, but yeah, absolutely, yeah. Any other questions? Well, eat up, drink up, and it's my thrill to be here. And again, I hope this, uh, I hope we can, we have good turnouts like this for future historical society meetings, right? So, uh, and, uh,